Welcome to Season 8, Episode 39 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Tuesday the 1st of December, and this week we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and in the community. I'm Alan, and joining me this week is our usual contenders, Mark, hello. Hello. And Martin. Hello. Uh, But Laura is away today, so we have a special guest presenter from underneath the planet. It's Nick. Hello, Nick. Hello, how are you all? Tickety-boo. How are you? Pretty good. Not too bad. Uh, early morning here in Australia, but, um, you know, cup of coffee, ready to go. Sweet. So people may know your dulcet tones from another podcast, which is uh, System AU, am I right? Uh, they might know my voice from System AU, but um, you've got a pretty big audience, so I have a feeling a lot of people probably haven't heard my tones at all. Oh, stop it. <laughs> uh, so where, where, where can uh, people find out uh, how to get hold of System AU if they want to listen to more of your lovely voice? Oh, look, well, I'm not going to list every single point of contact because there's uh, quite a lot of them. But basically, uh, systemau.net.au is your best bet. Uh, we've got a couple of RSS streams there, and um, we're pretty new uh, to the to the Linux slash tech podcast world, but we're enjoying it. Excellent. Well, I hope you get a few extra listeners uh, out of this. And So do I. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get on with it. And now it's time for the news. And first in the news, Alan. Uh, I'm in the news. Oh, brilliant. Oh, yes. Uh, (laughs) Of course. uh, uh, In the news, security researcher Joe Nord has discovered Dell have inadvertently shipped laptops to customers containing a self-signed root certificate installed and its private key, which apparently this means a malicious hacker could exploit this floor on open public networks like Wi-Fi hotspots, coffee shops and stuff to impersonate any other website to a Dell user and quietly intercept, read, and modify all of their vulnerable Dell system web traffic. Oh, dear. Mm, Is yes. this as bad as the the Lenovo Superfish thing, or not as bad, or just as bad? Or mm, I think it's a bit worse because you've got the private key on the system as well. So the Superfish stuff was more about intercepting things. It didn't mean that you could spoof so much. Um, so, yeah. What's interesting about this is that a lot of people have said, you know, oh, you know, Windows, Windows troubles and all the rest of it. But what this illustrated to me is you put a lot of you have to put a lot of trust into the provider of your computer to actually get it right. And there's nothing to say that somebody selling, say, Ubuntu laptops couldn't make the same mistake and actually How expose very dare you well, <laughs> well i'm not saying that this is a flaw in ubuntu Are but you this saying is entroware would do that no i'm not saying entroware would do it i'm saying <laughs> dell might but do dell it, might it, might it. Done it with Windows. <laughs> um yeah i mean yeah i mean yeah it, the exact exact same yeah. flaw is possible yeah, on any could, any operating yeah, system on any operating system yeah hmm but dell have now pushed an update to remove the certificate which is a uh, good <laughs> how how many machines does this affect is this like only something bought in the last year or is this you know going back to windows 98 or what mm, i'd read that it, it affected some machines since august this year so i don't know i don't have a precise number i can put a finger on but you know given dell sells a lot of computers that probably a lot of computers in the last what four months well given this this news article came out like you know just this month or just last month and they've already pushed an update to remove it i think yeah, you know, they've done the right thing to remove it and not, you know, try and claim that it was, you know, anything other than a mistake. So yes. I applaud them for that. But yeah, they shouldn't have done it. The- Moving on. Nick. Hello. Yeah. I get to talk about uh British politics. This is uh, a <laughs> uh, this is good. Um the UK uh Internet Service Providers Association has met with the Home Office uh, and they've outlined some of their concerns with the draft investigatory powers bill. Um, the head of what is uh, one of the best-named ISPs in the world, Andrews and Arnold, uh, presented a six-page document discussing the group's ethical and technical concerns of the bill's proposal. Um, this is quite interesting, uh, as uh, we, we've got very similar stuff going on in Australia at the moment regarding metadata retention and uh, and the government basically wanting to snoop. Um, but uh, here you've uh, you've got a quite a cluey fellow. Um, giving some pretty good reasons as to why the government uh, won't find any use out of this information. 
Um, yeah, he's he's written some um, some choice articles and made some amusing videos in the past about you know how clueless our government uh, departments are in this kind of you know area, which is an area of his expertise, being that he's run an ISP for a very long time. Um, I've read the document, and while you know there are some interesting choice quotes in there. It also did look like it had just been hammered out really, really quickly, <laughs> and then yeah, yeah, yeah. like like a massive rant, you know, and then and then emailed in. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm being a bit disingenuous. I don't know. No, I mm. you, you look. I actually looked at the uh, document and went, "Oh yeah, this looks like a kid wrote it." Really, uh, <laughs> not not very <laughs> nice letterheads. <laughs> yeah, but um, the, the the one that got me though was because in Australia, uh, with the law coming through, um, a smaller ISPs uh, under the same scrutiny as the larger ISPs. Now, um, according to this article, uh, it says the smaller ISPs um. Uh, are not intended to be hit as hard because uh, they are smaller and it is um, harder to log all this data, which uh, thereby just makes the whole law pointless. Um, right, everyone just moves to a different ISP, <laughs> yeah. don't they? I mean, yeah, currently, yeah. <laughs> uh, all of the current um, laws regarding um, you know blocking of certain websites and so on um, have all currently been on the big four ISPs and anyone who's not, so I'm not with one of these ISPs, and it's none of it's affected any of me, which again makes it completely pointless. Whereas I am with one of them, and, and it's still completely pointless. And, it, and it's also completely pointless because I just open an SSH tunnel to my VPS in London and bypass yeah. these stupid controls. Yes. Yeah. And just for the record, I'm um, not with an ISP that uh, is uh, implementing the same measures either, so I'm not experiencing or any indeed of that. one that uses you know anything like cables or silly things. Like <laughs> no, that. no. Why would you use something as old fashioned as a bit of wire? <laughs> but yeah it's uh, good to see good to see that you know um talk about this bill is still being uh you know it's still news it's still something that we need to be concerned about and write to people about and make noise about indeed definitely uh, next up um mozilla has released firefox os 2.5 developer preview which includes an android app which allows you to try out firefox os without flashing your device so if you have an Android phone, you can go to their website and download the app, which installs as an alternative home screen launcher. And it's Firefox OS, but within Android. So you can launch Firefox OS apps as well as all of your normal apps and play around with the sort of environment of boot to Gecko and see all the setting screens and stuff. Some of them don't work because they use the Android settings, but it's good fun to play around with, actually. That's a rather cunning way of sidestepping the whole making devices lark and... <laughs> having to do hardware support because all you're doing well not all but the the main thing you do is just supply your your entire environment as a, a standalone app is effectively yeah. what they're doing i don't i don't think this is something that which they're intending as a, a method of shipping firefox os i think this is to put it in the hands of developers who might otherwise not either buy a phone or have a dedicated firefox os phone but they did they did supply de uh, dedicated Firefox OS phones like the Firefox Flame was was a developer phone. Yes, no, I mean but people who you know people who might be interested you know might have in their head oh yeah I've got an app and I could probably make it work on Firefox OS but they're not actually bothered enough to go out and buy They're not $100 of... bothered. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly, not $100 bothered, not not have a phone you know flash a phone bothered but they might be installed an app and play around bothered is this is this accurate enough to actually use as a development environment in development platform well yeah because well, it's it, just uh, firefox yeah. so yeah you know, i mean it's yeah. you create a web app with a manifest and it's all contained in the same way that it would be on a firefox phone it would it should probably behave in you know 99 percent the right. same way okay so so yeah. purely I mean, you, for can, you can download html5 applications you mean yes. right okay yes you can you can download apps from the firefox uh, os marketplace and run them within this firefox os environment okay so i was i was chatting on telegram within firefox os within android using the firefox os telegram app because yeah it's just basically launching html5 apps cunning do you have yeah. uh, Firefox OS devices over in Oz, Nick, or have they not made their way over there? Uh, look, in Oz, it's a bit odd because uh, we, we certainly do get a lot of the major brand mobile phones, but we've got a really big grey market uh, for phones in, Aust uh, in Australia. We've got a, a, a large um, uh, sort of a Asian contingent because we're so close to Asia. Uh, a lot of grey market phones and a lot of uh, phone shops in the middle of uh, shopping centres and whatnot will uh, also sell 
phones. I've not seen a Firefox phone, but um, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a few about, but certainly not through official routes. Mm, interesting. I've tried some- to run this uh, as as the developer preview. Uh, I installed the APK on my uh, Marshmallow One Plus One, uh, and it failed dismally. But um, you know, it, it's running oh. Marshmallow, so. I yeah. <laughs> don't know whether I'm going to blame the Firefox uh, for that and whether I just blame my phone. My Yeah, I was running it on a OnePlus One, but it's running the um, whatever the current uh, supported Cyanogen OS is, which is still on the not Marshmallow, the one before it. Yeah, uh, your cool. lollipop, lollipop, there yeah. <laughs> and there's some other news from Mozilla as well. Yeah, um, they are seeking a new home for Thunderbird. Um, again? As they, yeah, again. Well, I think they... They previously announced that they were basically going to stop developing it themselves and anyone else could, you know, still c- c- contribute patches from the community and whatever. Um, but they've said that it's uh, time to uncouple Thunderbird and Firefox so they can focus on activities um, like Firefox that can have an industry wide impact. And there's apparently at least one organization interested in taking con- custodianship of Thunderbird. So at we'll least see who one. That is. At That's least better than one. none, isn't it? Yes. It's infinitely better wow. than none. <laughs> Why would you say at least one? <laughs> well, That's maybe just a really bizarre. If you're if you're talking about having industry wide <laughs> impact, why would you say? And someone down the pub promised us that they would look after Thunderbird for us. Yeah, it, it's not quite clear what what that means. It doesn't. It isn't clear if this means Thunderbird will move wholesale out of the Mozilla camp to a new org, a new entity entirely, or if it will stay within the Mozilla infrastructure and be maintained and developed by another outfit you know none of that seems to have been decided um at this stage they should move it over to the Ap- apache foundation that will be a hundred percent successful I would oh imagine. dear or oracle maybe oracle would be a better bet yeah. moving on um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation have announced the Pi Zero, a smaller, cheaper Raspberry Pi, priced at five US dollars or four pounds. It's available free this month on the cover of Magpie magazine, uh, and that was issued in the UK last Friday as we record this podcast. And circulation of the Magpie magazine with the Pi Zero will be coming to the US very soon. Uh, and the initial run of Magpie and all 30,000 Pi Zeros were sold out within 24 hours of uh, the announcement. And there are more on the way. I got one. Uh, well, on the magazine. Yeah. Did you leave it in its plastic wrap like a good boy or have you ripped it apart? And well, I'm going to be it? using it. I didn't buy it just to look at. I'm not some weird magazine. Collector. You're not Topi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a perfectly normal magazine collector. There's nothing weird about it at all. So, yeah, this looks good. It's a nice, you know, very small, inexpensive computing device with slightly fewer features, but, you know, useful for projects, I would imagine. Yeah. So it's got, um, it's sort of comparable in terms of specs to the um, the first generation Raspberry Pi. It's got the same system on chip and same amount of RAM, slightly higher clocked processor. Um, and it's got... Um, one micro usb port for data and another for charging uh and it doesn't have the gpio pins in it but it's got the headers for them and a few other headers which are unpopulated so you can you know stick bits on if you want those features but if you just need to if you just want to use it for very basic stuff then like you know just for doing some python programming or something then it's good to go for that the makers are going to love this aren't they for integrating into you know robots and contraptions and what have you it's i saw one one uh hack where someone had um made uh, an original xbox controller they would put it inside that and they were playing doom on the raspberry pi zero yes. with the xbox controller connected up to a tv they've done that in yeah, that four days Eden. yeah he i saw terence tweet about this uh and uh he was discussing with someone else has anyone like has anyone else bagsied this as a as a cool project to do <laughs> and and then he did it <laughs> yeah it'll be in a couple of days look quite cool yeah so uh sean Bupre, i think is how you pronounce it discovered and documented a vulnerability that affects all snapdragon 805 devices such as the motorola droid turbo slash max they have wacky names, the American phones, uh, Motorola Nexus 6 and Samsung Galaxy Note 4. Dubbed Trust No One or Trust None. Trust None, I think. Trust None. 
Yeah. It affects all publicly seen versions of the Trust Zone kernel, an ARM feature that allows a secure world kernel to run alongside the normal world kernel and was successfully exploited to unlock the Motorola Droid Turbo's bootloader. The mm. most important thing is that it's got a catchy name. Yeah, they've well, taken indeed. they've taken the Z. Does it have a they've logo? taken the Z and just you know rotated it ninety degrees. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah, it's clever, isn't it? <laughs> so are we? <laughs> are we concerned about this? Do we need to throw away our Motorola Nexus sixes in disgust? Well, well, arguably all phones are you know compromised in some way. If you believe Edward Snowden, yeah. so you know this is just so what's one more compromised? Yeah, I think, just, I think what this yeah, th- this is a sort of a double edged sword because on the one side you're going to have the Android hackers who are going to be very pleased that there is now an exploit to unlock the bootloader on some of these devices that don't have a legitimate means of doing that. But the other side of this is this is another find in a litter, litany of discoveries in how insecure this trust zone kernel is and how badly it actually handles um, the validation of inputs that it re- receives. So, yes, this is probably one of more to come. And, uh, yeah, it does mean that this is a means of um, a phone being compromised fairly, fairly trivially, but predictably. Well, I think that's all the time we've got for news this week. And now it's time for some community news and events. And first up on the community news is uh, the new... Oh, no. That's the second one. Uh, the first one is, um, is uh, Didier Roche sent a mail to the uh, Ubuntu developer list uh, today, which uh, I found interesting. Um, he wants to make more languages baked into the live CD, the live Ubuntu CD by default, because at the moment there's a small number of languages on the CD when you boot up, and then you choose a language partway through the install, and then extra stuff gets downloaded from the internet to make those languages work. And what he's proposing is we bake more of the standard languages into the CD so that they can be distributed in places where English isn't the first language and uh, people don't have to download extra stuff in order to get the uh, language that they want to use, which mm. I thought was quite That's a good idea. interesting. I wonder, idea. wonder if Did has looked at what some of the flavors are doing, because if you look at some of the flavors, that's already happened in some... Any flavor in particular? Well, I took, I took inspiration from a couple of other flavors. <laughs> um, and the way, the way I did it is I actually looked at the, um, uh, the statistics of who was reading the Ubuntu Mate website from around the world and then drew up a top 10 list of countries and then used those languages as the languages that are available on the on the image. Interesting. Uh, Didier used uh, Popcorn in yeah. the popularity contest thing to see what, uh, what languages... I didn't have access to and, that at uh, the time. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, Not now. Not, no, I, I do now, but at oh, the time, okay. yeah. Uh, congratulations, by the way, for lasting 19 minutes before mentioning Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the uh, <laughs> sec- second item, uh, which was almost the first one, but is back to being the second one, is the new community council uh, has been elected. We mentioned this before, that uh, the uh, vote was ongoing and the uh, new community council has been announced. Um, and it comprises four... Uh, canonical people and four non-canonical people, I think, if I can count correctly. One, two, three, four. Yes. Yes. A few new yes. faces. Uh, one... Five. F- no, no, sorry. Five non-canonical. No, no, sorry. I'm trying to include Mark Shuttleworth in the count and getting it wrong. Well Just done. carry on, Alan. Ignore me. Okay. Uh, a couple of uh, interesting new uh, faces, um, including Scarlett, Scarlett Clark, who works on KDE and Kubuntu. Uh, and as part of her mission statement, if you like, for joining the CC, she said she wants to build bridges between Ubuntu and Kubuntu. So, well, that's good. Yeah. Yes, yes, excellent. Shall I move on uh, to the next one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, uh, in the community news, the UEFI Forum Board of Directors have announced the firmware test suite as uh, recommended in the as the ACPI 5.1 self certification test today. And the reason why I mentioned this in there is because actually Firmware Test Suite was a project started by uh, someone in the Ubuntu community, Colin King, who works on the kernel team. And uh, it was quite nice for that uh, set of tools that do 
testing of firmwares to be adopted by uh, the UEFI forum board. I think Excellent. that was really good. Cool. And, and we, we do. have some events. Uh, the first event in our calendar is the 10th Egg and Raspberry Pi Jam, which has the code name Gamification. That's taking place in uh, the Gartner offices in Surrey on Sunday the 17th of January and it says bring along your gaming centres and your game controllers and other games that you can play with your Raspberry Pi to show them off. I should cool. go along and take my you really Pi should. Cade, shouldn't I? That would be good you fun. My purchase should. order for a Pi Cade was denied so... <laughs> What, why did they deny it? What are you doing to Raspberry Pi arcades that they just don't no, want you to I, have I, I asked my wife if I could buy one and she said no. And now I have a sad <laughs> face. <laughs> ah, now you see, what I did was not ask my wife if I could I buy one. I did that once with a massive <laughs> television set about 20 years ago and I've learned never to do that again. Ah, it's funny. I did that with a massive TV as well. And uh, yeah. It, it, did it go a lot better for you? Nope, it did not. In my defence, oh. my father-in-law persuaded me to do that. So it's all his fault. I'd just like to say that uh, having heard this podcast many times before, I always thought you said egg and raspberry jam. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm now reading the notes and it's egg ham. Egg it's, egg it's, not, it's not egg, yeah, yeah. ham and raspberry yeah, yeah, jam. No. Yeah, yeah. I, d- I just thought it was a play on, <laughs> you know, a play on food names. <laughs> yeah, it turns out there is actually a place called Eggham. There you go. Yeah, there knew? you go. I do now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> moving on, uh, January 21st to the 24th in California is SCALE, Southern California Linux Expo 14X at the Pasadena Convention Center. It's the largest community-run open source and free software conference in North America, and there's a whole load of people from Ubuntu, including me, going. And uh, attached to SCALE, there's going to be an UbuCon Summit with loads of uh, talks and workshops and stuff, very much like the mould of the old uh, Ubuntu Developer Summits of yore. Oh, oh! We'll put links in the show notes to the expo, but there's also a um, the Ubuntu California Loco team have got a, a meetup page, uh, and you can, if you're going to come along, then you could, uh, you know, click your mouse on the buttons necessary to say that you're coming along. That would be great, and I'll maybe see you there. Ooh. Uh, We also have FOSDEM 2016. FOSDEM is a free and non-commercial event organised by the community for the community. The goal is to provide free and open source software developers and communities a place to meet. And it's at the uh, University Libre de Brussels uh, in Brussels, Belgium on the 30th of Jan to the 31st of Jan 2016. Yes. uh, Any of you going? Uh, No, I I would love to, but I can't Mm. get the time off work. Yeah. Mm, uh, alas, I'm a bit busy. <laughs> <laughs> if only there was a conference in Australia, and, Nick. Well, funnily enough, it's the day after. It's on the oh, first really? of oh, February. Oh, so it is. Yeah, What's it's that, the then? day after. Well, that's linuxconf.au, um, which is Australia's um, uh, biggest uh, Linux uh, conference, I believe. Now, it's it's not in the style of Og Camper, uh, where it's sort of a community-run event. This is a you know very much sponsored by corporations. Um, but yeah, uh, quite big. Apparently Linus comes down nearly every year for it, not to speak, just to yeah. have a holiday. Yeah. And come diving. Yeah, I've, I seen, think. Uh, I've seen some of the videos and, and sometimes watch the, the live stream and I uh, watched it last year. There was a live stream, um, from one of the developers of a piece of software that Linus started, um, some diving software for managing your, you know, your scuba diving records and the guy was talking about how they migrated this software i can't remember what it's called now but migrated their software away from gtk to Qt, and how much easier that made things and how fewer headaches there were when they moved from gtk to Qt. it was quite an interesting talk um and it was quite nice to uh watch that live and then uh, when people filed out the room see people milling about and then playing you know spot the linuxy nerd as you like oh i know him i know him look there's matthew garrett and uh you know yeah. well I, I think matthew garrett's coming again this year it's uh, it's got a keynote by uh, everyone's favorite community developer john o'bacon um so he'll be popping over for it and awesome. uh, what's even what's even more exciting on my end i've not been to a uh, linux conf but this is in my hometown uh so literally the conference center is only uh one and a half miles from here so um it'll that's be, quite it'll unusual be nice. for australia really isn't <laughs> what it? Are the like, everything is really spread out and <laughs> well, everything yeah, is spread out. they do 
they do try and put the Linux conf in regional areas, which is good. Like they uh, obviously have it in our capital cities, but um, they sort of go out of their way to put it in a bit of the smaller uh, towns to uh, promote it a bit more. So uh, yeah, that's February uh, 1st to 5th. And we'll be doing a live broadcast from it uh, as a bit of a self plug there. So if you're in Geelong, come along. Nice. Nice. Oh, nice. Ooh. Excellent. No, uh, that's, un- that's unofficial. Unofficial. Oh, what? Not affiliated with Linux? You're just going <laughs> to <No>. surreptitiously <laughs> no. sneak in with a microphone and stream or something? Uh, no, we've um, booked out a pub uh, for the night after the fourth night, so um, we'll have a we'll have a little room in a bar there and uh, a table set up so uh, people can have a few post Linux comp beers and uh, watch us talk. Excellent, Junk. lovely. That sounds great. And last up, we've got DevConf CZ 2016. And DevConf CZ is a free annual developer conference for all Linux and JBoss community developers, admins, and Linux users. And it's organized by Red Hat uh, from the Czech Republic in cooperation with Fedora and JBoss communities. And you can find more about that event at DevConf CZ. And we'll have links to that in the show notes. And I've neglected to put the date of that event, so I can't remember. But I think it was mid-February ish. Sometime yeah, next yeah. year. Yeah, all of these, all of I these events think. are in yes. our off period. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks very much. That's all the community news and events. We love getting your feedback, so please send it to us. Even the pointlessly mean stuff makes us laugh a little bit. If it's short, tweet us on at Ubuntu Podcast. If it's less short, but please no essays. Email us on show at ubuntupodcast.org. Or you can leave a comment on the relevant show notes on our website, ubuntupodcast.org. Well, that's it for episode 39. Uh, We'll be back next week when you'll be bringing you some of the interviews we recorded from OGCamp and some Command Line Love. And uh, maybe, Nick, will you be uh, around next week to uh, come back and uh, stand in for Laura? Because I think she's out again next week as well. Uh, Look, I've got nothing to do for the entire week. I'll just hang around. (laughs) fantastic Brilliant. thank you nick Brilliant. yeah we'll just leave you hanging on the mumble and we'll just like reconnect next week is that all right yeah that's fine Brilliant. Brilliant. thanks for joining us nick see you next week and uh thanks everyone for listening um see you next time Bye-bye. bye 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 So so we stop recording and start again?